Uh, we're going to be continuing our study through the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to cover the last part of chapter 14 tonight. Um, last week we talked about edification and, and exhortation and encouragement and how that we should pursue love first and, and then, speak, then seek spiritual things, uh, especially prophecy, um, to tell forth the word of God. And, and that should be our desire um, to hear the word of God proclaimed and to proclaim it ourselves. Uh, why? Because that is what builds up the church. And that is why prophecy is better. Um, it helps to accomplish the goal of spiritual gifts, and that is building up the church. And edification is the key to all we do in church. Um, now, tongue speaking brings attention to an individual. It focuses on them. It edifies that individual. It says, look at me, look at what I can do. Prophecy, on the other hand, edifies the church. It edifies the body. It doesn't say, focus on me. It says, focus on him. Don't focus on my words, focus on his word. And we learned that languages are of no use without someone to explain them. They profit the hearer nothing if they're not interpreted. And the counterfeit gift is even worse. It's, it's just a bunch of sounds that we really don't understand, like, like an untuned instrument. That's what Paul likens it to, or, or someone playing an instrument that doesn't know what they're doing. It's, it's, just, it's just noise. And really, that isn't the purpose of language. The purpose of language is something different. Languages weren't made so people could look at you and say, wow, that guy can really make a lot of different sounds. He is gifted. I don't know what he is saying, but God has blessed him with making noises. I, some of you, that is how you look at me, but that's fine. The purpose of language is for communication. And it's one of the attributes of God that he passes down to us. Since we're made in his image, he communicates, we communicate. He thinks, we think. He reasons, we reason. And we have to understand that Christianity is a religion of reason. It's a religion of logic. It's a religion of fact. We don't have a blind faith. We have a faith based on facts. A faith that is rooted in the truth. Now, we should be passionate and our worship should be heartfelt. But we shouldn't disengage our brains. We shouldn't disengage our minds. We focus on the truth. And that truth is that God loved us as unlovable as we are. He still loved us. And he provided a way for us to be redeemed. Not by what we do, but by what he did. And Christ died a brutal death so we don't have to. He laid in the grave for three days to prove that he was really dead. And he rose again to live forever, to prove that he conquered death forever. We are sinful. That's a fact. God loved us anyway. Fact. How much did he love us? He sent a substitute to die in our place. Fact. Three days later, the tomb was empty, and it still is empty. Fact. He really lived. He really died. He really rose again. That is why we sing. That is why we worship him. Not because of a feeling. It's because we know the facts. And it's because we know that we aren't worthy, but he is. And if knowing all of that doesn't make you want to sing, I don't know what will. And we learned last week what tongues were really here for and what they really meant. They indicated judgment. They were inferior. They are inferior to prophecy. And they could easily cause confusion and make people think that you are out of your mind. But prophecy, on the other hand, can lead people to repentance. And that is where we're going to pick up tonight. Now, edification is still in view, but Paul now turns more to focus on order as opposed to chaos. And the passage that we will be studying tonight 
is the basis really for a lot of the, the way we conduct a church service. This is one of the passages that contributes to the regulative principle of worship. And I know that's a bunch of words, but it just means it's simply we conduct service by what Scripture tells us. That's all it means. That's the regulative principle. If Scripture doesn't say it, then we don't do it. Okay? Now, some people take this a little far, and they end up with a very stiff, a very regimented service. Some people don't even use instruments because they say, well, it never mentions instruments. Um, but that's where you go if you take it too far. Now, on the other side, you have the normative principle of worship. Uh, this is simply if the Bible doesn't forbid it, then you can do it. Now, this can go too far the other way, and this will end up with people playing uh, Super Mario Brothers on a big screen um, during a sermon. This actually happened. I'm not making this up. Or, or dressing up like Toy Story characters, all in the name of pragmatism. And I think this is far worse. And this is where we see a lot of churches going today. And most of them end up crossing over the line anyway and doing things that the Bible actually has forbidden. So I, I believe the correct view is somewhere in the middle. But services must be orderly and respectful. And, and I think this is something that we should not make light of. Um, if our worship and our conduct isn't orderly, then it isn't edifying. It isn't helping anyone to see Christ in us. It, it doesn't represent our God. He is a God of order. He ordered the entire universe. All of creation points to order. Intelligence brings order. Mindlessness brings disorder. So can we please stop telling people that if they don't like organized religion, then they will love our church? Can we just stop? Seriously. That's not funny. It's an insult. It's insulting. Being organized points to a God of order. And if we're not organized, then what God are we serving? The only true and living God is an orderly God. And orderly worship points to an orderly God. So what should a worship service look like? How should it be conducted? Let's look at our text. If you would, stand with me. Um, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting in verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If a man speak... In a tongue, let it be by two, at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it only unto to you only? If any man thinketh himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy or prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. You may be seated. Now, there's a few things in our text that we'll need to address, and, and we will as we come um, to them. But let me just say this. Even if you don't agree 
even if you don't agree that the gift of tongues or languages has ceased, you have to see that these instructions are not being followed by the people espousing that they still exist. They don't follow these rules. And I think that is very telling. And that is what happens when you elevate sensation over scripture and you elevate feelings over facts. Look at verse 26. He says, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. The first thing we see in our text is the overarching principle of orderly worship. The assembly of the saints at Corinth was a mess. It was utter chaos. Everyone was trying to do their own thing at the same time. Everyone had something to say. Everyone had a song to sing. Everyone wanted to speak. Everyone wanted to explain and teach. And this led to disorderly worship services. And again, the focus was on the individual. It was what they wanted. Hey, I have something to say. I want people to listen to me. Now, we don't seem to have that problem, or we don't seem to have that issue here. Um, Because Brother Russell has to beg people to sing their own song. And and we have to beat the bushes to find people to teach. And most of you don't make any noises through the entire service. Um, I was actually tempted to call for a welfare check on some of you a few weeks ago just to make sure that you were still among us. We have gone completely the other way. But the church, at, the church at Corinth was full of people who wanted to be involved. But it seemed, to be that, it seemed like they wanted to be involved for the wrong reason. They thought that what they had to say was more important than what the other person had to say. Everyone needed to say or sing or explain what they were thinking. And it became a free-for-all. And no one was benefiting from it. And that's what Paul was trying to correct. And, and this was because all, the focus was all inward It was on self. It was on me. That's what they were doing. And you can't build someone else up if the focus is primarily on you. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And Paul really reiterates the key to what we do when we come together. And that's edification. Pastor West talked about it this morning. Building each other up. And the Greek word is oikodome. And it's it's an architectural term. It literally means house building. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Everything we do when we come together should be for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. That's what we should do. And if it doesn't build up, then we shouldn't do it. I think it's pretty simple. He says all things should be done unto edifying. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure that means everything we do. All means all, right? I mean, we say that for other things. We have to say it now. Correct? Maybe. Some of you could be dead. I don't know. <clears throat> so it means everything we do should be done to edification. And if it doesn't build up, then what is it doing? There's only two options here. Only two. If it's not building up, then it's tearing down. Why would we do that? Does it make any sense? Everything we do should edify the church. And if it doesn't edify the church, we need to stop doing it. It's like when you go to the doctor and you say, hey, doc, it it hurts when I do this. And he says, do you really need to do that? And you're like, well, come to think of it, no. Then stop doing that. If it hurts when you do it, don't do it. If you don't have to. And we're constantly hurting ourselves. Hurting the body of Christ. Why? If it doesn't edify, we shouldn't do it. Now, orderly worship is rooted in the building up of the church. And so Paul gives us some guidelines. Let's look at them uh, that spring up from that root. Look at verse 27. If any man speak in a tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. And that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. 
First, we see the proper procedure for speaking in tongues. There is one. So Paul lays out four simple rules to eliminate the havoc that was ensuing in the church at Corinth. And this disorder would also be present at any church that doesn't, doesn't or didn't cautiously regulate tongues. And, that, and this is exactly what the modern charismatic movement doesn't do. There's no regulation. It is a total jumbled up mess. And <clears throat> even if this gift is still, was still active or is still active, which I believe it isn't, they're not following the guidelines that are laid out in Scripture. And they're very carefully laid out. And, and, and I want to also point out that in this instance, Paul uses the singular tongue. Why did he use the singular tongue? This time it's not because it's the false one. It's because the subject is singular. He's not talking about the fake thing. Why would he? It would make no sense for Paul to give us um, instructions on how to regulate something that was counterfeit or something that was false. That makes no sense. He would just say, don't do it. Okay? So he says tongues are to be spoken by two, at most three. And I think part of this is he's saying if you absolutely have to do this during a worship service or a church meeting, it should not be the pinnacle. It shouldn't be the focus. It really, you shouldn't do it that much at all. Only two, or at most three, should people, people should do it. Not everyone. Not everyone. He doesn't say everyone do it. It's not a requirement, which some people say that it is. It's not. It's actually optional. And, and the modern charismatic movement breaks this rule egregiously. Now, the next rule, each one in turn or one at a time, more than one person should not be speaking at any one time. Why? Because it is super confusing. It's even disturbing. Now, I had a friend that I worked with um, at a printing company I worked with in Arkansas. And when I was going to seminary, and so I'd go to seminary during the day, I'd work at the printing company at night, and I, I met this guy, and him and I became really good friends. And we talked, about, um, we talked about religion, we talked about all kinds of things. And he was a like-minded brother, and um, I really never asked him before this um, what church he went to. And so he invited me to his church, and it had a, a name that really didn't you know, go with anything, so I didn't know what denomination it was. And so they had a special event. It wasn't during, you know, it was on a Saturday or Friday. I can't remember. And so I went. And I had no idea what I had gotten myself into until the pastor had everyone stand for prayer. Now, this is normal. That's what we do, right? You just did it a couple minutes ago. Everybody stood up. We prayed. But he called on someone to lead in prayer. And when that person started praying, everyone else prayed too out loud and at the same time and some of these people weren't praying in English it was unsettling at the very least it was actually very disconcerting it was creepy uh, my skin and my whole body was just like this is not right and so I talked to my friend after it was over and I was like hey I said what was that he said, yeah, I know, it creeps me out too. And so I never went back there. And I encouraged him not to go back there either. Because it was the opposite of edifying. It's the opposite. It's very disconcerting. Now, next Paul says, let one, let one interpret. And this is another rule that is broken or just disregarded by the NAR in the modern charismatic movement people will ramble on and on and sometimes just making noises and there's hardly ever someone that will interpret what was said um, and that's mainly because they can't because nothing was actually said right um, but there should be one person speaking at a time and one person interpreting that's the most orderly and understandable way to do it now I remember going to India with brother Matt and um that was one of the most, uh, it was one of the greatest 
uh, experience I ever had, not because I was with Matt, it was, be, but it was because I got to go to another country and I see, saw how they worshiped. And they worship way better than we do. They know how to do it. But I, I was going there. I went to India to serve as an interpreter. Um, I interpreted Oki English to proper English and, and vice versa. Um, because there was a, there's a big gap there. Let me tell you, there's, it's huge. Uh, but I remember listening to Brother Matt preach, and Brother Ginn was up there, and he was interpreting what Brother Matt was saying to his congregation in, in Tonkal, in his native language. And sometimes Matt would say a short sentence, and Ginn would speak for a long time. And then sometimes Matt uh, would have a long statement, and Ginn would just only say a few words. And, and Matt actually stopped once, and, and he, he like looked at Ginn, and he said, Are we preaching this, the same sermon? And Ginn said, yeah, um, some things are just easier to say in my language. <clears throat> but when someone that speaks a foreign language, when we have someone that speaks a foreign language, that's the pattern we follow. There's one speaker and one interpreter, and they do it in order. And then he said, <clears throat> the last rule for the gift of languages that Paul gives is zero interpreter equals zero speaking. If there is no one to interpret, then there should be no one speaking. And if this gift is truly from the Spirit of God, He won't move you to speak unless there is someone there to interpret what you're saying. Seems pretty simple. If we all have unity, if we're all in the same Spirit, He will move us all in the same direction. So if there's no interpreter, if you feel like you need to say something, but you know there's no one there to interpret, what are you supposed to do? Keep it to yourself. Pray silently. That's what meditate. That's what Paul says. Because it's not about you and what you think needs to be said. It's about him and what he leads to be said. Look at verse 29. Let, all the, let the prophet speak, two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye all may prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. So secondly, we see the precise instruction for prophecy. Now, these are very similar instructions to the instructions given to us for languages. Why? Because they're coming out of the same root. They're coming out of the same root of edification and of order. Now, we really need to understand that prophet in our text tonight can apply to both senses of the word prophet. Okay, there were still prophet in, prophets in Paul's day. And these were men who heard directly from God, then spoke forth the truth of what God told them. Today, we have men who hear from God. How? By reading his word. And then what do they do? They speak forth the truth of God from what he said in his word. So these rules still apply to us. <clears throat> and this is how we conduct worship. So first he says two or three may speak. This shouldn't be a free-for-all either. Only two or three should speak during a given meeting. That's what he is saying. Now in most Baptist churches we have reduced this to just one. Because most people would not come back if we had two people speak, okay, in one service. You guys couldn't handle it. Too long. So we split the service in two, right? Pastor West takes one, I take one, and we do that for your benefit. And I'm still not really sure how well that is working out. We'll see. But next he says, let the remainder consider he said, let the rest judge what's being said. <clears throat> and now this isn't being judgmental, it's just being cautious. Okay? We need to examine what is said. In Paul's day, the other prophets would discern what was being said, if what was being said lined up with what God told them. Okay? If it didn't, then someone wasn't being led by the Holy Spirit. They were being led by something else or someone else. Today, Every one of you should be examining what is being said all the time. 
we should all be Bereans. In Acts 17, during Paul's second missionary journey, he, he was with Silas, and they were in Berea. And the believers there examined what he told them, and he commended them for it. Acts 17.10 says, Paul and Silas by night came into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. So they took what Paul and Silas said and compared it with Scripture to see if it lined up. It did. So many of them believed. And this is what you should do when you hear a sermon. Whether I preach it or Pastor West preaches it, search the Scriptures for yourself. See if it's true. See if it lines up with the Bible. If it does, then believe it and put it into practice. If it doesn't, then come talk to us. Come talk to us about it. Don't, don't talk to your friends about it. Come talk to us. Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we just misspoke. It's very possible because we're not perfect. All, I'm, I'm just trying to warn you, as Paul was warning them, just don't believe something based solely on the fact that I said it or that he said it. Believe it based on whether or not God's word says it. Now he says they should speak one at a time, one by one. The Holy Spirit is not going to move someone to interrupt someone else who is already speaking the word of God. Why would he do that? He wouldn't. Remember, God is a God of order. He wouldn't move someone to break in with a more important message. He doesn't work like Fox News. Okay? He doesn't. Again, the problem being addressed here is pride. Thinking what you have to say is of more importance than what is currently being said is a pride issue. So, why, why all these rules? Why, why are there so many rules? <clears throat> Paul says, so all will learn and all will be encouraged. And this is the ultimate goal. To learn of God, <clears throat> excuse me, and be encouraged by our, by our fellow members. If we're not doing that, then why are we here? Why, what are we doing here? We all need to learn. We all need to be encouraged. And orderly worship and clear communication are what allows that to take place. Look at verse 32. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Now we see the primary benchmark of worship. He says the prophets are to be in control of themselves. They shouldn't be acting weird or unnatural. That's not what receiving God's word or preaching God's word looks like. It's orderly. It's not ecstatic. It's not out of control. It's under control. 1 John 4, 1 tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. And we should be able to examine what is happening, to see what is happening, and determine whether or not it's of God. And verse 33 is the key. God is not going to do something or cause us to do something in worship that is contrary to his character. He wouldn't do that. He's a God of certainty. He's a God of order. He's a God of peace. Now look at the latter part of verse 33. As in all churches of the saints, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now here we see the speech that is not permitted. Now I know this is something that people don't want to talk about, and, and really I was going to put this in the subtitle of my sermon, uh, but I didn't want to mislead you, and, and most people don't get my humor. 
But my title was going to be Orderly Worship. Subtitle, hey lady, be quiet. But I think too many people might have been confused by that, and God's not the author of confusion, so I changed it. But seriously, these verses have been the center of much controversy. But when we really examine them and we see them in context of the entire letter to the Corinthians, we can better understand what Paul is saying here. Now let's start with what he isn't saying. He isn't saying that women are never to be allowed to speak. He's not saying that. Why would he give instructions about how they were to speak and to pray with their head covered if they were never to speak at all? That doesn't make any sense. And when you put the latter part of verse 33 with 34 and 35, it makes even more sense that he's saying, listen, this is the custom in all churches, not just Corinth. And this is what we should do. But what is this regarding? It's regarding what this chapter is about, tongues and prophecy. That's what he's talking about. Just as the prophet spirits are to, are to be in control and subjects to themselves, women are to be subject to their husbands. That's the created order. That's their role. Remember? I mean, we spent a couple of sermons talking about that. And Paul is merely pointing out that women should not be leading They should be submitting when everyone is gathered together. And again, this is not a slight. This is not a slight on women in any way. This is just not the role they were given. God told Eve that's how it would be in Genesis 3.16. He explained it to her. Paul references this in, in 1 Timothy 2, starting in verse 11, when he gives instructions to Timothy on the operations of the church. He said, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And as we learned before, this has nothing to do with a woman's woman's value. Absolutely nothing. We're all equal in the eyes of God. We're all equal. This is about a woman's role. It's about the order of creation that was established by God. And we need to understand this has nothing to do with superiority and everything to do with submission to God's plan, his design. And this is also something that we we need to recognize in churches today. There are some people, some churches, and I use that term loosely, that they think this is not true. But why would the Holy Spirit move a woman to be a preacher or to have authority over a man when Scripture explicitly forbids it. He wouldn't. And if you say that, well, God spoke to me and that trumps Scripture, then you're saying that Scripture is insufficient. And that's a big problem. But You see this in many questionable churches today. All of these things are tied together. And I think that's what Paul is trying to point out. And if we really look at this, that's what he's saying. All this stuff, all this disorder, all of of that going against the created order is wrong. And apparently there were women in Corinth who were being disruptive. They were being out of order. They were interrupting the services. They were asking questions. Now you have to understand that the person... The person that stands up and asks the question is seen as the leader of that house. And that's why it's shameful. Because the wife shouldn't be the spiritual leader in the home. The husband should. He should be leading an understanding of spiritual things and he should be able to answer any question that's posed to him. And this is about men and women performing their proper roles. That's what it's about. It has nothing to do with women being considered subpar or less than. That's not what it's about at all. And I know that this isn't popular, especially in the world we live in today, but if we took the parts of the Bible, we took them out that were unpopular or that we didn't like, there wouldn't be much left. Look at verse 36. What came the word of God out out from you or Came it to you only? 
If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now we see the rebuke again of their pride. They were not the authority here. They were taking the place of authority, but they weren't the authority. Paul was. The word of God came to them from Paul, not the other way around. And they didn't have the corner on the truth. That's, like, that's what they were saying. Well, we, we know because God is speaking to us. But they didn't have the corner on truth. God, God had spoken to many other churches by his spirit through Paul. And if anyone thinks they know better, they don't. And if they say something different, they're wrong. Because God's spirit doesn't tell two different people two different things. He doesn't tell them things that are contrary to each other. That's nonsense. God inspired Paul to write these things. If you don't agree, then you are disagreeing with God, not with Paul. And that's what he's saying. Look at verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Finally, we see the correct pursuit in worship. Desire prophecy because of what it does and all the benefits it brings. Don't forbid languages because they serve a purpose. That's what he's telling the church. Prophecy incites true worship, and that worship should be marked by integrity and order. Representing God and pointing to God, the God that we worship. Now, Matthew Henry said, Manifest indecencies and disorders are to be carefully kept out of all Christian churches. In every part of divine worship, they should have nothing in them that is childish, absurd, ridiculous, wild, or tumultuous. But all parts of divine worship should be carried on in a manly, grave, rational, composed, and orderly manner. God is not to be dishonored, nor his worship disgraced by our unbecoming and disorderly performance of it and attendance at it. Our worship should be done in an honorable and organized manner. Why? Because we serve the God who ordered everything. And we serve the God who is worthy of all honor. Now, as we prepare to close, maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe you don't agree that these gifts have ceased. Okay. But you have to see at least that this movement, this NAR movement, doesn't line up with the Bible. It just doesn't. They don't follow the rules. They don't follow the rules that were given in Scripture. We do. Does that mean we have everything right? No. Does everything we do edify the church? I don't know. I don't think so. Not everything. Does everything you do here edify the church? We need to examine what we're doing. If it doesn't build up the church, then we should stop doing it. Now, do you take everything Pastor West says and everything I say as being 100% accurate without seeing if it matches up with Scripture? Some of you do. But you shouldn't. That's dangerous. Make sure that we agree with Scripture. Be Bereans. Search the Scriptures for yourself. And if we agree with Scripture, then follow the instruction. Because it isn't from us, it's from God himself. Now as we stand together and Brother Russell comes, I hope that you have been encouraged tonight. I hope that you can see the why behind the how we do things. And you've heard a lot in the past few weeks about edifying the church. And my question is this, are you actively and intentionally doing that? Are you actively and intentionally edifying the church? You should be. Maybe you're confused tonight. Are you confused? Are you conflicted? God's not in that. He wants you to be certain He's a God of certainty, not confusion. 
Do you feel like God is moving you to do something? Does it line up with the Bible? If it doesn't, repent and move on. But if it does line up with Scripture, then what are you waiting on? What are you waiting for? Making disciples lines up with Scripture. Being a part of a body of believers lines up with Scripture. Being baptized lines up with Scripture. Putting your faith and trust in Christ alone lines up with Scripture. God is calling all men everywhere to repent. How long will you wait? Get right with God today.